This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Today's primary day in Maryland. In one closely watched race, former Congress member Donna Edwards is seeking to win back her old seat in Maryland's 4th Congressional District, outside Washington, D.C. She's facing the corporate attorney Glenn Ivey, who's raised seven times as much money. The New York Times reports a new super PAC run by APAC, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, has spent nearly $6 million on the primary race in an attempt to defeat Edwards, who served in Congress for four terms, ending in 2017. In 2008, Donna Edwards made history, becoming the first black woman elected to Congress from Maryland. Another group with ties to APAC, the Democratic Majority for Israel, has spent over $425,000 to help defeat Edwards. The two groups also poured money into efforts to defeat other progressive Democrats, including Nina Turner in Ohio and Jessica Cisneros in Texas. We're joined now by Peter Beiner, editor-at-large with Jewish Currents. He recently wrote an article headlined, The Israel Lobby's New Campaign Playbook. Peter Beiner is professor at the Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at City University of New York. Thanks so much for joining us, Peter. Um, can you talk about what Donna Edwards is confronting right now in Maryland, the level of money that's being poured in to defeat her? It's really extraordinary for a House race to see one organization, one super PAC, spending almost $6 million. What we're seeing across the country is that APAC's super PAC uh, is often spending as much as the campaigns themselves are spending. Partly this is the result of Citizens United, the Supreme Court decision in 2010 that created super PACs, which are these entities that can accept unlimited amounts of money and spend unlimited amounts of money, as long as they are theoretically not coordinated with the campaign. And it's also the result of the fact that APAC and allied establishment pro-Israel organizations saw a threat starting in 2019, when people like Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez were elected to Congress and have decided to spend virtually unlimited amounts of money to ensure that their brand of politics, pro, which is more pro-Palestinian rights, but which is also more progressive on economic issues, does not become the future of the Democratic Party. And, Peter, could you talk about what you discovered in terms of uh, connections or ties between groups like mainstream Democrats and, uh, and other uh, pro-Israel lobbies, like the Democratic Majority for Israel? Yes. One of the things that I found is that very often, when these establishment pro-Israel organizations target a progressive candidate, those candidates are also targeted by groups that are not focused on Israel-Palestine, but simply want to defeat that person because that person may be too progressive on questions of health care, or uh, they may support the Green New Deal. Um, so there's a group called Mainstream Democrats. If you look at their website, it says nothing about Israel-Palestine whatsoever. It just says it doesn't want the Democratic Party to be taken over by far-left groups. But mainstream Democrats is actually run by Democratic majority for Israel. So what you see is this very, very close alignment. They work out of the same offices with the same staff. So essentially, this extremely close relationship between groups that want to defeat progressives because they support Palestinian rights and groups that just want to defeat progressives because they essentially want the Democratic Party to be dominated by people like Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema, who will do the bidding of the fossil fuel industry, the healthcare industry, the financial services industry. And, and how successful have these efforts been uh, in the past? Uh, uh, Amy mentioned the races of Nina Turner in Ohio and Jessica Cisneros in Texas, both of whom were uh, targeted at, uh, uh, by APAC and both of whom uh, lost their races. Uh, what's been the track record of these efforts? These efforts, sadly, have been very successful. There have been a couple of races, one in Pennsylvania, one in Illinois, where the progressive candidates were able to win. But 
even but in most cases the the car candidates targeted have lost and even when the targeted candidates don't lose it has a chilling effect politicians out there see this and think i do not want millions and millions of dollars dumped into a house race against me and so what it tends to do is lead candidates who might be more inclined to take progressive positions on palestinian rights or on other issues to instead keep their heads down and not take those positions in order to try to avoid the kind of attacks that other progressives have faced. So, let me ask you, back on Donna Edwards' race, Peter, um, you have the Speaker of the House, right, Nancy Pelosi, who actually comes from Maryland, though she represents San Francisco. Um, coming out in full support of Donna Edwards. Now, while most of the big money spent in the race has come from apac aligned Super PAC, um, the ads funded by the so-called United Democracy Project don't mention the Middle East. And I wanted, then, to talk about Nancy Pelosi, um, who really came out and attacked um, the kind of money, the attack ads by the apac aligned groups like United Democracy Project, prompting this response in June from House Majority Leader Nancy Pelosi. This is what she said. When Donna Edwards first represented Maryland's 4th Congressional District, and that was for nearly a decade, she was one of the most effective members in Congress. Donna fought hard for Prince George's County, for jobs and investments in her community, to help constituents in need, and to deliver results. As speaker and then as leader, I knew I could always count on Donna Edwards as a valued member of our leadership team. So that's Nancy Pelosi endorsing Donna Edwards. Now, the ads often and the candidates who are supported by these massive, no, I mean, the massive amount of money, millions in the case of this campaign going to her opponent. Um, they're not raising the issue of Israel and Palestine, right? And also, let's be clear, there are other pro-Israel groups like J Street, more progressive, that supports Donna Edwards. Yes, but J Street doesn't have, only has a small fraction of the amount of money that APAC and Democratic Majority for Israel have on the other side. But you're exactly right. In almost none of these races do the attack ads actually have anything to do with the actual agenda of the organizations that are paying for them. And that's because APAC and DMFI know that not very many voters in these districts actually really care that much uh, about Israel-Palestine. They care about local issues. So what APAC does is it, uh, DMFI do, they do poll testing and they attack people on these kind of whatever they think may gain traction. So in Ohio, in the Nina Turner race, because Nina Turner was a Bernie Sanders supporter who had been critical of Joe Biden, they painted her as not a loyal Democrat. In the case of Donna Edwards, they're claiming that she didn't provide good constituent service when she was the congressman, congresswoman early on, as if APAC or DMFI could care less about the level of constituent service that Donna Edwards provided to her constituents when she was a congresswoman. I mean, it's transparent nonsense, right? It's just that this is their vehicle for trying to defeat her, because Donna Edwards in the past has shown some minimal, right? She's hardly radical on the subject, but just some modest concern for Palestinian human rights. For that reason, they want to defeat her. Can you talk about the role of Bakari Sellers um, in the, the, these campaigns? Yes. So Bakari Sellers is, a, is a, a, a former South Carolina politician with close ties to APAC, who has been now heads another super PAC. Um, that is de devoted primarily at this point to defeating Rashida Tlaib uh, in, in Michigan. And its claim is that it's, a, it's an organization that wants to elect black Democrats. Um, and uh, Rashida Tlaib has a black opponent. But again, this is also transparent nonsense, um, as, if, as if APAC and its donors are really concerned about increasing black representation. They're, they're, re they're going after Rashida Tlaib for one reason only, because she's a Palestinian member of Congress who is, become, who is a passionate and eloquent defender of the humanity of Palestinians. And she brings that issue.
issue to the fore in Congress like no one else does. But again, because that agenda itself, if laid out nakedly, would not be very popular, you have these transparent um, uh, claims that it's really about something else, in this way about the claim that somehow, because she's not black, she doesn't. She can't represent a district in Michigan, even though, in fact, she has strong black support and has been a very, very tireless uh, uh, defender of the people in her district of all races. And, and Peter, interestingly, there is also a governor's uh, race uh, uh, in Maryland, uh, mm -hmm. uh, both competitive primaries in both the Democratic and the Republican parties uh, uh, to. Uh, to elect a successor to the Republican Governor Hogan. But uh, uh, has APAC been involved in those races at all, or is it only concentrating on these congressional races? APAC's focus has overwhelmingly been not just in, in, in congressional races, but in Democratic primaries in congressional races. APAC's a, a, a assessment has been that because of partisan polarization, there are fewer swing districts, which means that more often than in the past, the member of Congress is chosen in the primary. They also have noticed that there are an unusually num large number of open House seats this year because of redistrict and retirement. And they, and they like to do open House races because once an incumbent has been elected in our system, they can be difficult to dislodge. So what this play is really about is trying to create a whole new generation of younger Democrats in Congress who will tow the APAC line on Israel-Palestine, also, in many, many cases, also take a kind of more pro-corporate position, and therefore blunt the, the trend that we were seeing towards the Democratic Party moving in a more progressive direction. We just have 30 seconds. But this is new, right, APAC having this kind of super PAC? Yes, APAC, despite its name, never had a political action committee. But it saw, essentially, that it needed to roll out the big guns in response to the trends that we saw with the election of the squad members. And it has extraordinary financial resources at its disposal. Several people, for instance, have given a million, written million dollar checks already, and the money is still, ta is still being tabulated. Peter Beinert, editor-at-large of Jewish Currents, will link to your new piece, Israel Lobby's new campaign playbook. Israel advocacy groups have developed strategies to raise huge sums for their candidates by appealing to corporate interests. Coming up, we turn to the pioneering legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw, who's launched a counteroffensive against right-wing attacks targeting critical race theory. Um, it is Freedom Summer this week uh, around the country. That's right, a summer school for CRT. Stay with us.